had enormous status. Now, as Muhammad chanted the verses of the Quran, the words became music as he touched a deeply spiritual nerve in his listeners. Many stepped forward to embrace Islam and its message, but for Muhammad, they were not accepting something new, simply returning to an old religion. In many ways, the prophet was calling people back to the one true faith, to the faith of Abraham, and back to the one true God, not to a new God, but it, it was to the one true God whose revelation had, had gone to Adam, Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. And therefore, Muhammad, in every sense of the term, is a reformer. So far, Muhammad had avoided any mention of the idols that stood in and around the Kaaba. Now he announced that the Quraysh would have to stop worshiping all other gods. He demanded a radical new expression of faith. The words began. He is Allah, the one and only. Allah, the eternal, absolute. He begetteth not, nor is he begotten. And there is none like unto him. There could be no greater loyalty than to God, not to any tribal deity, not to some traditional idol, not even to the tribe. This mild-mannered merchant was now demanding Arabs forsake the gods of their ancestors. Their real identity was rooted in their uh, family and clan and kin connections because it was that that gave them a position in the world. When Muhammad comes with a new uh, set of religious ideas or is trying to renew a set of religious ideas focused on monotheism, uh, people whose ancestors had been pagans said, what are our, what's happened to our grandfathers, our great-grandfathers? And Muhammad had to say, well, they're burning in hell because they didn't believe in one God. This new commandment was to be called Islam, meaning an act of surrender to God's will. For some, initially, they could simply dismiss the prophet, since this was so out of whack with the society, as, as somebody who was uh, uh, out of his mind, as somebody who was deluded. But as he began to develop this seminal community, and as the prophet, given his conviction, was so uh, public in preaching this message, then, then more and more of this was taken by the Quraysh establishment as a direct threat. The new message of Islam now ripped the fabric of the Quraysh community. Soon, like Jesus before him, Muhammad's ministry was turning father against son, family against family. The establishment certainly feared uh, that a man who claimed to be receiving special messages from Allah, the high god of the Arabian pantheon, uh, would soon demand greater political powers. The most powerful Quraysh leaders turned on Muhammad and his followers. Muslims were tortured. Some were whipped, others staked for days in the fierce Arabian sun. Muhammad himself endured the fury of his neighbors who hurled dirt and insults at him in the streets. For two years, Quraysh leaders placed a ban on intermarriage and trade with any followers of Islam. No one was allowed to sell them food. The agony of this period increased when Khadija died in 619. When his uncle died not long after, he lost his protector, and it became clear that Muhammad's life was in real danger. His wife is dead, his uncle is dead. Uh, although he has followers, many of them are being tortured, imprisoned, persecuted. He is powerless to help many of those that, that he loves, and many of those that have, have believed in him. It is in this devastating time, as Muhammad came to the end of his resources, that he had his greatest mystical experience. On a night in 620, Muhammad was again awakened by the angel Gabriel. The angel presented him with a winged horse-like creature that flew the prophet through the night sky to Jerusalem. There he was greeted by Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and all the other prophets. At last, the creature took him higher and higher beyond earthly space and time. Muhammad departed his physical body, and his spirit at last stood at the summit of the universe. His celestial journey to Jerusalem suggested to Muhammad that he was entering into a new phase of his service to God and Islam. 
He now also understood that he could no longer remain in Mecca. Over 200 miles to the north of ancient Mecca lay the fertile oasis of Yathrib. It was a lush island of green amidst harsh volcanic mountains and untillable desert soil. Its sweet water and abundant crops of grain and dates made for a comfortable life. But Yathrib was troubled. The tribes who lived in this beautiful place were locked in a deadly state of rivalry. Crammed together in this small oasis, the tribes were caught up in a continuing pattern of warfare and violence. Something was needed to break the pattern. In the same year he had made his mystical night flight to Jerusalem, Muhammad met six pilgrims from Yathrib, making the annual pilgrimage, or Hajj, to the Kaaba in Mecca. He told the men of his mission and recited the verses from the Quran. The men were immediately moved by Muhammad's message, but they also saw in the Prophet someone who could mediate the stalemate of violence in Yathrib. They made him an offer. The citizens of Yathrib would submit to Allah. In exchange, Muhammad would become their leader. Muhammad was invited to a community that was in many ways divided and in disarray. And they basically invited him saying that they, they needed a strong leader to come in and to organize and lead that community. Muhammad saw a chance to expand Islam in Yathrib. He also saw a haven that would protect him and his followers from persecution. He urged all Muslims to pack their things and leave Mecca for a new life. It was a dangerous undertaking, but the Muslims were willing to take their chances. Muhammad and his closest disciples stayed behind until most of his followers had left Mecca. Quraysh leaders soon realized that once Muhammad left, he would be beyond their control and would become a leader of their rivals and possible enemies. The choice was made. Muhammad must die before he reached the new land. So that no one clan would have to bear responsibility, it was decided that one member of each would plunge a sword into Muhammad at the same time. The men frantically searched Mecca, but Muhammad had been warned of the threat and had made his escape. The following morning, horsemen pursued Muhammad and at last followed his trail to the entrance of a cave. Muhammad and a disciple were hiding inside. But Muslim tradition says the Quraysh